If you'll find your red book there in the seats underneath you, in front of you, behind you there, pass around, make sure everybody has a book. Let's turn to page 201. It's a good way to introduce uh, the Christmas uh, celebration here today. Uh, I uh, mentioned June a while ago. Uh, most of you probably wouldn't realize this, but Andy Crosby wrote this song. And uh, one, of the, one of the most precious songs for Christmas time in my way of thinking. It's not a carol, but it is a Christmas song. It's in all of books. It says, tell me the story of Jesus. Great, great, great song. Everyone join in together. Go by, and in the dark. 
morning with a praise team up front here. We're going to sing a couple uh, Christmas songs this morning, both a little country. We're doing country Christmas today, I think. Uh, so we want you to sing along with us, just have some fun with us. And uh, both these songs tell the story of Jesus' birth. Um, so just sing along with us as we get set here.
glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. Christmas message this morning is help is on the way. We're going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 8. So you're going to be turning there in your Bible. It's the only passage we'll be looking at this morning. Is it beginning in Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 18. We're going to be looking down through Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. You know, the title message this morning is help is on the way. 
beginning in Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 18. So we're going to end up this morning in a very familiar scripture um, about this, this overwhelmingly bright light, this blindingly bright light that's going to come into the world. Before we get to that passage of scripture, which everyone's going to recognize, before, before that light shines, I want us to see the darkness into which it is shining. As Isaiah gives that prophecy, I want you to see the darkness that Isaiah was in, that Israel was in, as this prophecy of this light that's going to come into the world, as that prophecy is given. I want, you to, I want to read the, the, the passage above that so we understand the darkness into which this light is shining. And so if you would, please stand in honor of God's words and read this together. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 18 through verse 20. We'll begin there. It says, Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts, which dwell, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. And when they shall see, excuse me, <clears throat> and when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God? For the living to the dead? To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to his word, it is, it is because there is no light in them. Lord, in prayer together. Father, we thank you, God, for your word. God, your revelation. And God, as we read this, God, this is your very word. This is as if you were speaking directly to us this morning. God, this is your word. And God, we, we love your word. We love how um, all-encompassing your word is. Father, we, we love how that you have given this revelation. God, how that you were able to give prophecy, predicting events, the events that would have been impossible in the present. You give prophecies and, and you prophesy that they will take place in the future and they come to pass. That's hard for us to get our minds around. That it requires you to be timeless, dwelling outside of time, to tell us of future events exactly as they're going to happen. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your revelation. And we pray that this morning we would receive it as just that, that it's you, not just a religious text, not just some, some old book, some religious book, but it is your very word, your revelation, your self-revelation, the revelation of yourself to us. And God, I pray that we would receive the word that we're hearing this morning, and that God, that we, would, again, would be transformed by it. We pray and ask all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. So to give you the context of what we're reading, and Isaiah can kind of be a difficult prophet to read because the way he writes, it's probably the most complex wording in any of the Old Testament, any passage in the Old Testament. The metaphors that he uses, the allusions that he uses, I mean, it's just incredibly rich language that he uses, but it's very easy to get lost as you're reading through this. So I want to give you the context of what, what's happening and what, what we're reading this morning. Isaiah was one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament. And Isaiah is calling Israel back to God. Israel has been rejecting God, and it's not something recent. It's been going on for centuries. Israel, God's people, they've been rejecting Him for centuries, turning to idols, turning to paganism. And as we read in this passage, this is how dark it had gotten. They were turning basically to witches, to like fortune tellers, people that had familiar spirits. They were, they were trying to like have like a seance to consult with the dead about future events. These are God's people. There was child sacrifice. They were sacrificing their children to Moloch. They were worshiping these idols and in, in rejection of God, all of this in rejection of God. And so God would send prophets. And you think about a prophet, think about a prosecutor. When a, when a prophet shows up, um, it's never a good sign because the prophet is showing up as like the prosecutor of the covenant that God had given. So, um, so, you know, God has made a covenant with, with his people and they are violating the covenant. And so then God sends a prophet, which is like a prosecutor, to, to prosecute them and to point out that, you know, the, the crimes that they are committing, the covenant that they're violating. And so that's what Isaiah is doing. Is he, is, he is showing up and he's pointing these things out, calling these things out amongst the, the people of Israel, and he's calling them back to God, calling them to repentance. And, it's, and as we're reading this, they're, they are consistently 
turning to darkness, because as it says there at the end of verse 20, there is no light in them. There is no light in them. That's how dark it has become in Israel. Basically, Israel and Judah are self-destructing. They are self-destructing spiritually. And that self-destruction will soon um, become a physical self-destruction. They are destroying themselves from the inside out. And I'll just pause right there as we think about that. that and I would say just as it happens today. You know, we read these things about in the Old Testament, whether it's in the Garden of Eden, whether it's the nation of Israel, whether it's the Jewish people in the days of Jesus. It doesn't matter whether it's America in 2023 or whether it's your own personal life. We see these same things, these same things happening over and over again, these same patterns repeating themselves of self-destruction. It begins with spiritual self-destruction, and then it leads to a physical self-destruction. God is the light. When we reject Him, there's nowhere to go but to darkness. When we, get, when, we, when we turn away from Him, when we reject Him, God is the light. And when you reject Him, you only get darkness. So then we come, that's what we're seeing here. We then come to verses 21 and 22. It says, and they shall pass through it, hardly bestead and hungry. And it shall come to pass that when they shall be hungry, they shall fret themselves and curse their king and their God and look upward. And they shall look unto the earth and behold trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness. Instead of recognizing their rebellion and crying out to God, because of the affliction that they're suffering, because of their self-destruction, they curse God. It gets even worse. They curse God and their darkness gets darker. As I said, God's Word is so fascinating. You see these same themes being replayed over and over and over again. You think about addiction. You think about things like pill addiction, alcohol addiction, pornography addiction. Um, people get addicted to money. Um, all those things, it always takes more and more and more and more. It's ne you never get enough. You always need more. And it gets darker and darker and darker. It never stays put. It's a con either, you are, either you're going towards God or you're going away from God. There, there is no neutral. There is no neutrality. You're either going towards God, you're running to Him, or you're running away from Him. It's either getting brighter or it's getting darker. And we see those themes replayed over and over and over again. Because it's the same story. Over and over again, we see the same thing happening today, being replayed today, being replayed in our own lives. But as we read through this passage, and what's going to happen is Isaiah is writing to the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, and he's warning them, saying, judgment's going to come. Destruction is going to come. And it's going to come in the form of the Assyrian invasion that's going to come in and completely destroy the ten northern tribes. About 130, 140 years later, Judgment's going to come to the southern, to the southern um, kingdom of Israel, kingdom of Judah. It's going to come with the Babylonians of Nebuchadnezzar. Jerusalem's going to be burned to the ground. Um, the temple's going to be burned to the ground. And, and many of the Jewish people are going to be taken off into captivity for 70 years. That's what Isaiah is warning and saying, turn, turn away from this. The judgment of God is going to come, turn away from this. God's no respecter of persons. You, know, you think about the children of Israel, they came out of Egypt, they were in slavery and bondage. God brought them into the promised land and God took the land of Canaan away from the Canaanites. People are just exasperated by all the brutality and these things. You understand the land of Canaan belongs to God. It's His land. Everything is His. It belongs to Him. And He sent the children of Israel in and He took the land away through the Israelites. He took the land away from the Canaanites and He established the kingdom of Israel. But you know why He took it away from the Canaanites? Because of rebellion and idol worship. And so God took it away from them. Well, now what's Israel doing? Now it's rebellion and idol worship. And God says, again, he's no respecter of persons. He says, I'm going to take the land away from you. I'm going to send the Assyrians. I'm going to send the Babylonians. And that's what happens. That's the darkness that, that Israel is in and that they're facing. And this is where we turn the corner. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 1. Nevertheless, be this as it may, the things that are going on, we get this in verse 1. Nevertheless, 
The dimness shall not be as such as was in her vexation. When at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. Those are the, the northern tribes. And afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea. Beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. Verse 2. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death. Upon them hath the light shined. Whenever judgment and destruction came upon Israel, it always came from the north. Because you have a desert to the right, that Mediterranean Sea to the left, and so or, or to, to, they have the, a desert there to the east, they have the Mediterranean Sea there uh, to the west. And so these kingdoms would come from the north. And so it was the northern tribes who always got the brunt of it as they begin the invasion, the Assyrian invasion, the Babylonian invasion. And God says, but as that darkness and that judgment has come from the north, a light is going to shine and come from the north into this place, into this land of the shadow of death. But now in Israel's deep darkness, the shadow of death, the light is going to come from the north. It's interesting that this passage, as I was thinking on this this week, it mentions Galilee of the nations. And so Galilee, which is where Jesus is from, there's southern Galilee and there's northern Galilee because as you're going up through Israel, you know, you, you have, the, you have this, this country of Israel, but as you go up to the north, it starts to kind of, you start to get some Gentile and Jewish um, intermingling there, where, where the, there's not a, a hard line there between the Gentile nations and in Israel. They begin to kind of intermingle there as you go to the north. And so, but, but as I was, that's where Galilee of the nations is. The northern part of Galilee is considered Galilee of the nations. The southern part was considered more a, a true part of Israel. But it's interesting as I read this because I was reminded um, over in John chapter 7 when, when there's all this debate about who Jesus is, what they're going to do with Jesus, the Sanhedrin who are the Jewish leaders, they're debating about who is Jesus. You know, what are we going to do with this guy? He's performing these miracles. All these people are following him, but he's not honoring us. And so we can't accept him. We have to reject him. He's, we know he can't be the Messiah for all these different reasons, but yet he's doing the things that only the Messiah could do. And so there's all this controversy about Jesus. And basically, they're, they're saying, we've got we to get rid of this guy. No trial, no anything. We just have to get rid of him. And a man named Nicodemus speaks up. You recognize him from John chapter 3. We came to Jesus by night. Nicodemus speaks up and says, Do we, can, we try, can, can we judge a man without a trial? And they turn to him and say, are, are you from Galilee also? Are you one of his? Because don't you, you, you've read the Scriptures. You know that there's no prophecy concerning a prophet from Galilee. Yes, there is. We just read it. And they had it. And they knew it. They were so blinded by their hatred of Jesus, they forgot their Bibles. Men who really, these are men who maybe had the prophet Isaiah, they might have had him memorized. But they forgot this. Because they were so blinded by the rejection of Jesus. There most certainly is a prophecy about, about what's going to, this bright light that's going to come out of Galilee of the nations that we read here in these first two verses. And I would point this out. This is a future prophecy of this light that's going to come. I mean, it is incredibly dark now. It's going to get even darker. But this bright light is going to shine. This great light is going to shine. Those that were in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shine. Do you notice anything strange about that? About how that's worded? I'll tell you what's odd about that is this is a prophecy. And they don't know when this is going to be fulfilled. We now know it's going to be fulfilled 700 years later. But I want you to notice something about this passage. It's said in the past tense. The people that walked, not the people who are walking in darkness, will see a great light. And they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them will a light shine. That's what you would expect for it to say. But instead it says, the people that walked in darkness, darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. It's written past tense, 700 years in the future. Do you know why? Because God is timeless. The future is just like the past to Him. That's how certain this is. He is giving this prophecy as if it's already happened. James and I, sitting at Shoney's yesterday, 
we're discussing this very thing. The things that are still yet future to us, they've already happened. In the mind of God, they have already happened. Everything is past tense. Everything is completed. Everything is fulfilled. That's the God who we're dealing with. That's mind-blowing to me. You see, when God created, He didn't just create space and matter, the heavens and the earth. He also created time. He dwells outside of time. We're time-bound. He is not. The Bible says He knows the end from the beginning. From before the beginning, before He began to pen the story like an author, He already knew the end. He knew how the story was going to finish. That is the God we're dealing with. And when you give these prophecies, which are, these are mind-blowing prophecies we're going to be looking at as we continue on this morning. But you notice it's written in past tense because it has already happened in the mind of God. It is that certain. We come on down to verses 3 through 5. It says, Thou hast multiplied the nation and not increased the joy. When it says not increase the joy, that's a weird wording. Isaiah can kind of, I think, be kind of hard to translate here. But it's, saying, it's not saying he hasn't increased the joy. It's saying thou hast multiplied the nation and you haven't forgotten the joy. As you've multiplied the nation, you've also increased the joy. They joy before thee according to the joy in harvest. And as men rejoice when they divide the spool. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise. You, you hear this rumbling of the army coming in. Garments rolled in blood. But this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. What in the world is he saying here? He's saying the nation and the joy will be multiplied with rejoicing. The burdens, the forced labor, and that, that rod of the oppressor, that staff of the oppressor, that's like the club of the oppressor, the overlords, the bloody garments of, of the conquerors are all going to, is it saying there at the end when it says, but this shall be burning with fuel of fire. It's saying all of this is going to burn up. The burdens, the forced labor, the club of the oppressor, these bloody garments of the conquerors, all of this is going to vanish away and be burned up. Gone. Oppression, gone. Fear, gone. Darkness, gone. Burdens, all gone. As in the days of Midian. It goes way back to, to the time of the judges. Um, a guy named Gideon, they were being, the people of Israel being oppressed by the Midianites. They had been, uh, they were being conquered by them. They were being, they were being uh, not really enslaved, but they were being dominated by the Midians. And finally, um, enough's enough. They're going to finally break out from underneath the, Midian, the Midianites. And um, the war is going to break out. A guy named Gideon, remember, remember how many troops Gideon had? 32,000. He's going to go. So he's rounded up the troops there in Israel. They're, they're going to finally, there's going to be a revolution. They're going to finally cast off the burden of the Midianites. He's got 32,000 men to go and fight with. That's his army. And he is unbelievably outnumbered. It said the Midianites were like grasshoppers, like locusts, just covering all of the land. They stand no chance. 32,000 people. And God says, well, we got a problem. And Gideon's thinking, yeah, we definitely have a problem. And God says, you have too many men. He's thinking the exact opposite. And God says, reduce them. So he reduces them down to 22,000 men. And God says, we still have a problem. You still have way too many men. Reduce them down again. He reduces them down to 300 men. Because God is saying, I'm not going to share my glory with another. This is going to be a supernatural victory. This will be a miracle. This will not be a military um, you know, the underdog winning in a military battle, this is going to be a miracle. And that's what's being referenced here. God is saying, I mean, it is, it is as dark as it can possibly be, and then a miracle is going to happen. That's what he's referencing there as he, as he refers. And again, Isaiah just makes these little passing references. You've got to know the entire Old Testament and understand the context, understand what Isaiah is saying. As in the day of Midian, he's talking about a miracle is going to happen. This conquering will be a miraculous conquering, just like in the day of Gideon, just like in the day of the Midianites. All of this, oppression, fear, darkness, burdens, all gone, performed miraculously like in Gideon's day. 
All of this gone, and it's going to be replaced with light and joy and prosperity and rejoicing. Now, here's the, here's the, the $64,000 question. How is that ever going to happen? How is this ever going to happen? How is oppression and fear and darkness and burdens, how is all of this going to be taken away? Verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. That's where this fits in. When things in Israel were so dark, this prophecy is given. One of my favorite passages in the entire Bible it raises questions. A child's going to be born. What's his name? Everlasting Father. A child's going to be born. What's his name? Mighty God. When was the mighty God born? That makes absolutely no sense. Until 700 years later. And now us, 2,700 years later, 2,000 years after the fact, looking back saying, that's exactly what has occurred. God was born into this world. Exactly as it was insanely prophesied. It, this is impossible for that to happen presently. This is an impossible prophecy, but he's also predicting it in a future time. And it happened. A child was born, but a son was given. That's a huge statement. A, a son was not born. A child was born. But a son was given, which means that that son was pre-existent prior to his birth, exactly as Jesus claimed to be. The Son of God is infinite, has always existed. But the Son of God was given by the Father, and a child was born into this world. The human population, when Jesus was born, increased by a factor of one when Jesus was born. But the Son has always been and always will be. He abides forever. The Son was given. For God so loved the world that He gave. You, what, you know what you give? You give a gift. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, gave the gift of His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. A Son was given. You can take Isaiah 6, or nine, chapter 9, verse 6, and you can tie it directly to John 3, 16. In 700 years, a son will be given. Jesus stood there speaking to Nicodemus by night, and he said, the son has been given. And the government will be upon his shoulders. You know what? You know what can I paraphrase that a little bit? The weight of the world will be put on his shoulders. Now, I want to ask you, does that put you out of a job? Does it put me out of a job? Because you say, I want to try to put the weight of the world on my shoulders. Anybody else feel that way sometimes? All these problems you've got to try to fix? You feel like the weight of the world's on your shoulders? Well, the weight of the world, the government shall be upon his shoulders. Ruling the world will be upon his shoulders. You know, in the fall, that would be a good way of describing what we did when we rebelled against God as we pulled the weight of the world down upon ourselves. And now we're under it. We're under this load. We're under this weight. We're making bad decisions. We don't know what to do. Okay, you decide good and evil. You decide what's best. Mistake, 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 error, blunder, one after destructive blunders, one after another. You're not qualified to do it. Jesus Christ shows up and says, can I help you with that? Hand it to me. You can't carry it. Um, what did Jesus say? My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Put your load, put the weight of the world, which you could never dream to bear, put that on my shoulders, and here you have my burden. And my burden is easy, my yoke is light. 
Yoke is easy and burden is light. The weight of the world, the government shall be upon his shoulder. Jesus shows up and says, you need some help. Give that to me. He goes on and describes him and says, wonderful. Over and over again in the Gospels, Jesus said something, Jesus did something, and it said the people were astonished. I think they, I think they just froze. It sounded about like this. Just silent. Probably all these things were being said. What about this? What about We're asking these questions? And then suddenly Jesus Christ answered the question. And they, were si- and they marveled. They were astonished. Over and over again you see that. Wonderful. He was full of wonder. He performed some miracle. And everybody, it was just, every, no one said anything. Their jaws dropped. And they stood there in astonishment over and over and over again. Counselor, all the wisdom of God is in Him. If you lack wisdom, you go to Him. If you lack wisdom, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men freely, and it abradeth not. All wisdom is in Him. The mighty God the everlasting Father. Now wait, I thought He was the Son. I thought He was the Son that was given. Who's the everlasting Father? The Prince of Peace. The night before He goes to the cross, He said, I and the Father are one. If you have seen Me, you have seen the Father. In perfect, mind-blowing fulfillment of what was said 700 years earlier. Isaiah chapter 9, verse, verse 6. If you've seen Me, you've seen the Father. I am the everlasting Father, the mighty God. And because of all of this, This qualifies him and him alone to be the last one, the Prince of Peace. All of this is building up to the Prince of Peace. This child that is born, this son that is given, he is the Prince of Peace. And he will accomplish what he started 2,000 years ago, verse 7. Of the increase of His government, His kingdom, His reign, of the increase of His government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon His kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. When this was written, when this prophecy was given, Israel was, was beaten down and they were being further beaten down by their adversaries. The day of David was over. The day of conquering, conquering the Philistines, conquering those who would come against them, those days were over. Now they would become the conquered and they were beaten down and beaten down and beaten down. They had been beaten back and conquered. They would lose lands. They would lose cities. They were shrinking as they were being conquered. Well, now the king has come. The king has come and the kingdom has come. And now he's going to expand and it's going to take over the whole world. And that's what's been happening for the last 2,000 years is that Christ is taking over this world. That is what has has happened, is happening, and will happen is He is conquering this world. And no one can stop it. Of the increase of His his kingdom, of the increase of His government and peace, there shall be no end. It's not up to you. He's going to accomplish it. And you can't stop it. And I can't stop it. And I can't hinder it. It's going to be accomplished but I intend to be fully involved in it. You'd be a fool to do otherwise. No one can stop it. Righteousness and justice and peace are coming in complete fulfillment. It has come in Christ and it is going to come in complete fulfillment and it will last, as it says there, forever, forevermore. Peace forever eternal peace. That is what's offered in Jesus Christ. That is what He brings. 
And that's not an exaggeration. As we close this morning, I'm going to ask uh, the singers to come ask you to stand. As we close with this, considering these last few thoughts here, everything I've said this morning, it applies to the nation of Israel, it applies to Judah, it applies to the Jews, and it applies to me and you. Because his government, his kingdom, has expanded well beyond the bounds of, of Israel. We sit here this morning probably about 7,000 miles away from all these things happen, and it has expanded to us. His government, his kingdom has expanded us because he's the king. He is the king, period. Well, guess what? He's also my king. I have absolutely surrendered myself to him, and I hope you've done likewise. He is the king. And I would just say this as we close. Go back to that last slide if you would. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. The Lord of armies. I want, you, I want to say this this morning. This is not merely His will. This is not just God's will. This is God's zeal. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. It's not, it's not just God's will. It's God's zeal. What it's saying is He will passionately and enthusiastically make it happen. And He has. And He is. He is making this happen. And again, I'll point out, all of this is in past tense. Of the increase of his kingdom, there shall be, or excuse me, going down to verse, verse one. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, as if it's already happened. The government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. In the mind of God, this has already happened. It is that certain. There's one other passage that comes to mind as I'm reading these prophecies and I'm seeing these things given in past tense. There's one other scripture that comes to mind as we close this morning is this. It's Romans chapter 8, verse 30, and it makes this statement. It says, those whom he justified. And justified means that you're declared righteous before God. It means that you're saved. Your sin has been forgiven. Your sin, that weight of your sin has been placed upon Christ. And His perfect righteousness has been placed upon you. That is justification. And God has declared you righteous, morally perfect, righteous, perfectly obedient in the righteousness of Christ. That is justification. If you're here this morning, I hope and pray every person in this room this morning is saved, is justified. I hope that you, and you can only be justified by faith. You can only be justified by faith, by believing what God has done, what God has said. I hope that you're justified this morning. I hope you've put your faith in Christ and you've called upon the name of the Lord and said, God, Lord Jesus, please take my sin. Please give me your righteousness. I'm calling upon the name of the Lord. I'm bankrupt. I can't handle this load. Please take this load. And he takes that load from us and he puts his righteousness upon us. That is justification. And in Romans chapter 8, verse 30, it says, Those whom he justified, them he also glorified. Not, they, not them he also will glorify. Those whom he justified, them he also glorified. That's after the resurrection. That's so far in the future. We don't even know. We don't even know how far in the future that is. But, but you notice what it says. It says it past tense. Those whom he justified, them he also glorified. In the mind of God, I have been justified. I've already been glorified. That's how certain it is. Because of what Christ did for me. Because the Son has been given. Because the child has been born. The one who has brought light and righteousness. And has, and has brought eternal peace. Because of that, and because that peace is eternal, I, in the mind of God, I am already glorified. And so are you if you know Christ. And so I'm, I'm saying this morning, if you're here this morning and you've never been saved, you've never experienced that justification, this morning is the morning. You may not know what you're going to do right now, but God does. And He's speaking to you right now. You need to surrender yourself to Jesus Christ. Call upon Him that you may be saved. Saved not just this morning, saved eternally through Jesus Christ. As we sing this song, if you need to come and pray, I encourage you to come. Light of the world. Sing this together. If you need to come, I encourage you to come.